Hi, and thanks for joining us for our midweek Bible study here at Family of God Community Church. Savior say Thy strength Indeed is small Child of weakness Watch and pray Find in me Thine all in all Cause Jesus Paid it all All To him I owe Sin Had left a crimson Stain he washed it white as Hi, thanks for joining us as we conclude this series where we've been looking at the Ten Commandments of God and how they provide a foundational basis for us to protect our homes and our families and our lives. That's why we call this Homeland Security. Tonight we look at the last of these Ten Commandments, learning to be content. Let's pray together. 
Father, we thank you for your holy word and we thank you for these reminders in our lives of just how precious you are, how your character is. And Lord, as we endeavor to be more like you, more like Christ, we pray that we'll take these lessons that we've learned through your Ten Commandments and allow you to bring them to wondrous fruit in our lives. Thank you for giving us your holy word and for giving us the examples of who you are. For these are the things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, Jesus said that he did not come to do away with God's law, these Ten Commandments. He came to fulfill them. Since you and I can't ever live up to these Ten Commandments in completion or fully in any way, shape, or form, Jesus is the one who came. So we look at these Ten Commandments and they are definitely a representation of the character of God and Jesus Christ himself specifically as he lived here on earth. Now, when we look at these elements, as we've been through each one, we want to look at them in such a way that we understand two things. Number one, they reveal just how our shortcomings are in our lives, how we don't measure up to the character and the standard of God. But two, they give us biblical principles whereby we can live our lives, where we can focus on how God wants us to be. The Bible says that God wants us to be conformed to the image of his Son. And that means that these same characteristics that we see in Jesus Christ, these same characteristics we see in God and in his word here in Exodus chapter 20, they are a part of how God molds and shapes us to become exactly what he wants us to be. And so the last of these, as we look at these wondrous examples of God's character, is about learning to be content. The scripture says in Exodus 20 and verse 17, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his manservant or maidservant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Now that begs the question, what do you mean by covet? Well, let me give you a simple definition. Covet means the uncontrolled desire to acquire things. (laughs) Some people are just like this. They, They have an uncontrolled desire to acquire things. Now, they can be very organized in how they do this or very disorganized, like a hoarder who just has to have everything and hangs on to it and keeps it. But there are others who are constantly wanting what other people have And they ruin their lives in a number of ways. As a matter of fact, the effects of constantly wanting more can be quite devastating to our lives. Let's look at a few of them. Number one, fatigue. When you're constantly wanting something else, you're constantly seeking after it, you have an uncontrolled desire to acquire something, it often leads to fatigue. And a lot of people get into this situation where they literally overwork themselves. The scripture says in Proverbs 23 and verse 4, Don't wear yourself out trying to get rich. Be wise enough to control yourself. You see, coveting is the uncontrolled desire to acquire. You need to be wise enough to control yourself. Why? Because you're going to wear yourself out. You're going to live your life in absolute fatigue. Secondly, When you and I have this uncontrolled desire to acquire, when we covet things, we often go into debt. A lot of people who constantly have the acquisition of things and things and things, they they have a tendency because they don't have the financial means to actually get what they want when they want it, they go into debt for it. The scripture says, the more you have, the more you spend, right up to the limits of your income. So what is the advantage of wealth, except perhaps to watch it as it runs through your fingers? You see, the more you have, the more you spend. We never learn the effective means of being content. We just get into situations that bring extreme fatigue. We get into situations that bring extreme debt. But there's another aspect to this, the effect of always wanting more. It leads to worry. 
we worry about everything. We worry about what we have, what we don't have. We worry about how we're going to acquire something. And so we develop this sense of anxiety. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 5 and verse 12, a working man can get a good night's sleep, but the rich man has so much that he stays awake worrying. And so one of the effects of always wanting more is worry. So we have fatigue, we have debt, we have worry. And then here's a third thing, a fourth thing, excuse me, conflict. We have conflict in our lives when we're constantly seeking to acquire more, constantly wanting more things. It leads to conflict. In James chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, the scripture says, What is causing the quarrels and fights among you? Isn't it because there's a whole army of evil desires within you? You want what you don't have, so you kill to get it. You long for what others have and can't afford it. So you start a fight to take it away from them. What a horrible thing. Just to have a desire so strongly to acquire something that you're willing to hurt other people in order to get what you want. And yet, here James says, the reason you don't have what you want is you don't ask God for it. And even when you do ask, you don't get it because your whole aim is wrong. You want only what will give you pleasure. And so the effects of always wanting more are fatigue, debt, worry, and here, conflict, it leads to absolute conflict in our lives. And then finally, there is dissatisfaction. You know, you can want more and more and more and more, but you will never be satisfied. That's exactly what the scripture says. Those who love money will never have enough. How meaningless to think that wealth brings true happiness. And it does not, my dear friends. So what I want to talk to you just a few minutes about is how to learn contentment. Now, you say, what do you mean learn contentment? Isn't it just an emotion and a feeling or something? Well, Paul the Apostle told us in Philippians chapter 4 these wondrous words. He says, I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. And then he says this, I have learned. In other words, through my experience and through the things that I have studied and through discipline in my life, he learned the secret of contentment in every situation, whether it be a full stomach or hunger, plenty or want. And then he said this great passage that we have all heard before, Philippians 4.13, he says, I can do everything God asked me to do with the help of Christ who gives me the strength and power. I memorized that verse of scripture in another version where it says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He learned how to be content. And it was with that learning about contentment that he was able to say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me but it didn't come until he had contentment. There are a lot of people that want to claim that verse and say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But let me ask you a question, dear friend. Have you learned the lesson of contentment? Because if you haven't learned the lesson of contentment, you will never fully comprehend and understand how you can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Paul said, I've learned in whatever circumstance I'm in, I can be in prison or I can be free. I can be wealthy or I can be dirt poor. I can be eating a great meal or I can be hungry and not have any means to even purchase a meal. I can be in all of those situations and I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Why? Because I have learned the secret of contentment in every situation. You see, that's the key. And so with that in mind, let me give you just a few pointers, some things that you and I can do that will help us learn contentment. Number one, resist comparing myself to others. The very nature of covetousness is that it is a desire to want your neighbor's house, 
your neighbor's wife, your neighbor's servants, your neighbor's things, uh, everything that belongs to your neighbor. In other words, you're comparing yourself to others. We used to have this ideology when I was a young man growing up in the 60s, a young boy, actually, and you would hear it said, let's keep up with the Joneses. Well, that mentality led to a severe indebtedness in our society. It led to fatigue, debt, worry, conflict, and dissatisfaction, keeping up with the Joneses. Now, keeping up with the Joneses was nothing other than covetousness, a lack of contentment. You and I, if we're going to be happy and fruitful and learn how to rest in God, we need to resist comparing ourselves to others. Here in this passage in Galatians 6, verses 4 and 5, the scripture says, Make a careful exploration of who you are and the work you have been given, and then sink yourself into that. Don't be impressed with yourself don't compare yourself with others. Each of you must take responsibility for doing the creative best that you can with your own life. Don't get all caught up being impressed with yourself, but worse, don't compare yourself with others. You need to just be uh, content in what God has blessed you with and what he has given you. You need to look at that and sink your life into that. Make sure that you resist comparing yourself to others. You're unique. You are different. You don't have to be like them. What you need to be is what God created you to be. Here's the second thing. Rejoice in what you do have. You need to rejoice in what God has blessed you with. You look around and, and think about the things that God has blessed you with. Do you have a family that loves you? Do you have a job? Are you able to work? Do you have a measure of health? Do you still have your faculties about you and you can think, you know? Uh, just a lot of simple things we need to learn to be thankful for. When I was growing up, we used to sing that hymn in church, count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. You and I need to learn to rejoice in, in what we do have. Here the scripture says, it is better to be satisfied with what you have than to be always wanting something else. And all God's people said, amen. We need to be satisfied with what we have. The Bible says further in Ecclesiastes chapter 5 and verse 19, if God gives us wealth and property and lets us enjoy them, we should be grateful and enjoy what we have worked for. And then he adds this final statement. It is a gift from God. When you rejoice in what you have, you are looking at what God has blessed you with. You understand this is a gift from God that I have. Even its material possessions, these are things that God has blessed you with. And when you begin to rejoice in that, your life begins to take on that measure of contentment. You're learning contentment. But yet, if you constantly are seeking others, uh, you're going to hurt not just yourself, but all those around you. In this passage in Proverbs 15, verse 27, it says, Greed brings grief to the whole family. How many times have I seen this happen? It destroys marriages. It destroys families. It, that fatigue, debt, worry, conflict, dissatisfaction in the home will literally destroy those that you love the most. So rejoice in what you have and stop focusing on what you don't have. Resist comparing yourself to others and just be what God created you to be. Number three, release what I have to help others. You know, God blessed you and he has given you these wonderful things and as you rejoice in them, you need to begin to release what you have to help others. Uh, we encourage tithing in our church and, and much of that money that we receive, it goes to mission endeavors, it goes to reach other people for Christ, it goes to the proclamation of the gospel. Uh, but we also have benevolent needs that are always there 
the people in our community and in our church that are struggling. You know, something in their life has happened and it's put them in a position where they need help, whether it be with food or with a utility bill or gasoline for their car to be able to get back and forth to work. Um, We have uh, ministry in place to deal with those things, but we depend on the gifts of God's people. The Bible tells us we need to be careful about that. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 17 and 18, uh, Paul had instructed young Timothy, who was the pastor of the church at Ephesus, and they had quite a number of believers there who were extremely wealthy. And so he had a, a word of advice for them. He said, tell those who are rich not to be proud and not to trust in their money, which will soon be gone. But their pride and trust should be in the living God who always richly gives us all that we need for our enjoyment. God doesn't expect you to take away from what he has given you for your enjoyment, but he says this, tell them to use their money for good. They should be rich in good works and should give happily to those in need, always being ready to share with others whatever God has given them. Uh, My grandfather was always a generous man. My father is a generous man. And I like to think that I am a generous man too. There have been times I've been out and I've seen someone who were counting their pennies. I remember sitting in the uh, Cracker Barrel getting a quick lunch one day. And I saw this lady sitting over there. She was ordering her meal. She finally ordered her meal. And then she was counting her coins on the table to make sure that she had enough to not just pay for the meal, but hopefully to give something to the waitress who had served her. Uh, I called the waitress over and I said, please don't tell her, but I want to pay for her meal totally. And I will take care of the gratuity as well. And uh, I watched as the Waitress went over and said, Honey, your meal's been taken care of. She wanted to know who, and she said, It doesn't matter. Your meal's been paid for in full. And the tears rolling down her cheek, and you know me, I cry at supermarket openings. I'm sitting there crying the same way. Generosity and helping others in need is a blessing not just to them, but it's a blessing to you. And here's the principle that Paul was trying to teach young Timothy to share with these people that had it. Be ready to give happily to those in need. Always ready to share with others whatever God has given you. What a blessing. In this passage in Acts chapter 20 and verse 35, uh, the apostle says, I have been a constant example of how you can help those in need by working hard. You should remember the words of the Lord Jesus. And here they are. It is more blessed to give than to receive. And all God's people said, Amen. The final thing is this. You and I need to refocus on what's going to last. You know, the Bible says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures here on earth where moth and rust can get in and corrupt it and destroy it. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth or rust can never touch it. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. You know, they say you can't take it with you. But dear friend, you can send it on ahead. You can focus on what's going to last and invest yourself in the kingdom of God in the message of God, in the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 18, Paul said, So we do not look at what we can see right now, the troubles all around us, but we look forward to the joys of heaven, which we have not yet seen. The troubles will soon be over, but the joys to come will last forever. Dear friend, I pray that you learn the lesson of contentment. Thank you for joining me 
as we've looked homeland security. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for caring for us and for loving us. Lord, I pray for those who have been struggling, who have fatigue and debt and worry and conflict and dissatisfaction because they are struggling with this desire to always have something more, trying to keep up with the Joneses. Lord, I pray you'd set them free and that as they learn the value of contentment in every circumstance, let them be able to stand and say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I claim that for them and pray your blessings on them. Dear friend, if you're watching tonight and, and you don't know for certain if you died that you'd go to heaven, but you want to know, I want you to know too. So if you just bow your head with me and just pray a simple prayer of faith, the Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord and believe in their heart that God the Father raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You'll have a home in heaven and you'll be forgiven of all your sins, past, present, and future. So if you're wanting that tonight, will you take a moment and just pray with me? Just bow your head right now. God hears your prayer. Just say, Lord Jesus, I want to have a home in heaven with you one day. And I want to be forgiven of all my sin. I want to be cleansed. And so, Lord Jesus, I place my future and my faith in you, believing that you died on the cross for me and that you were buried and that you rose again on the third day. And so, Lord, will you come into my heart and my life Will you be my Savior to forgive me and wash away all my sins? Will you be my Lord to lead me and help me to make good and wise decisions in my life? And will you be my friend to walk with me through thick and thin, no matter what, teaching me the value of being content here and rejoicing one day in the joys of heaven with you? Dear one, if you prayed that prayer and you meant it with all of your heart, let someone know, family, friend, a, a neighbor, someone you work with that you know is a born-again believer in Jesus Christ. Tell them, today I accepted Jesus as my Savior. And they will rejoice with you. If you don't have anyone that you can tell, drop me a note there at Pastor Howard at familyofgodcc.com. I'd love to hear from you and pray for you. Dear ones, tonight as uh, we're finishing up this series, I want to encourage you to join me next week as we begin a new series, Running on Empty. So many times in our lives, we just burn out. We need to look into the Word of God and see what it says about how you and I can refuel our lives. We can encourage ourselves. We don't have to run on empty. We can run fully. And so I hope you'll join me next week as we start this new series. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you to watch you so that no matter where you go, you will go in faith, trusting and believing in God. And so until we're back together the next time, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hey, dear friends, as always, keep looking up. Mm -hmm.